Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership series. I'm Scott Miller. I serve as your weekly host. Delighted to have a reprisal today. Occasionally, we'll have a guest where people's downloads of the podcast and views of the video interview are so big, we invite them back on for a deeper conversation. And today, Corey Kogan warrants that accolade. Corey, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So glad to have you. An author of three books for Franklin Covey. Yes. You were, for many years, the, the, the leader of our productivity practice. You still are sort of our key thought leader around productivity, project management, presentation advantage. You co-authored The Five Choices, which became an instant bestseller on the Wall Street Journal list. Since then, you've earned, I don't know, 800 million miles <laughs> traveling around the world, speaking, I'm going to guess, in almost every continent. Correct. About the book, right? Yep. Everybody wants to be more productive. Everybody and does. And have better balance. Yes. And, and, and take back some of their, their sanity, right? in an ever-increasing world. So today we're going to take some deeper dives into specifically choice three. Before I do that, I want you to walk through each of the quick five choices, kind of as a refresher, and talk about maybe just five seconds on each. So choice one, if you need me to pitch you up, which I'm sure you don't, I will, but choice one. So uh, Act on the important, don't react to the urgent. Great. Choice one uh, is really about the intentional discerning of everything that's incoming through the methodology of the time matrix. So really thinking about the matrix of important or the confluence of important and urgent and putting it together and really as things are coming in, discerning very intentionally if it's important and needs to be done now, if it's important but just a distraction, if it's just uh, excessive use and a waste of time, or is it really important, not urgent, these are the really important things I need to do, and then how do I minimize or eliminate some of the other things that are incoming in order to make sure I get these things done well to feel accomplished at the end of the day. You should speak publicly. Because you've got the content down. Thank you. You know, just this week I had Lena Renee, your co-author, as yes. a guest on the radio program I host on iHeartRadio, Great Life, Great Career. We had a whole discussion around our urgency addiction. And, and you talk a lot about how it's a leadership competency to protect your team from that urgent addiction. Um, riff on that for a bit. Uh, I just went through this yesterday with a senior leader where they work constantly and even you know talked about the fact that they don't have time to eat and the only hmm. food they got was three different cookies that were set in three different meetings during the day okay. and a bottle of water and her entire team is seeing that as a model hmm. and so if the leader is doing that and the team is watching that then you are creating that culture of extreme busyness and urgency, which is a terrible thing in this day and age to get anything done or even to be able to think, to even be able to innovate or just execute on anything. I'm seeing an interview with you back on choice one. Okay, so yes. stand by. Let's talk about choice two. Go for extraordinary, don't settle for ordinary. So choice one and choice two really comprise the competencies or skill, uh, skills of decision management. So if we're able to filter all the incoming that comes in through the time matrix, choice two is about stopping and thinking about and actually diagramming your most important roles in life that are both functional and emotional, just the few, there's a lot of them, but the few that you then really decide well, who am I in that role and what does accomplishment look like? And then every decision that you are making through the day is benchmarked against Am I doing what I need to do to really fulfill that role, to be extraordinary, to feel accomplished in that role every single day? Your brain requires that kind of target in order to be able to measure things and make that decision. So go for extraordinary is really those few roles and what does success look like in those roles and then all day long thinking about mm, am I no. making the right decisions right. to get there? Right. As the lead author of this book, you have kind of redefined the notion, the practice, that it's no longer about time management. It's really about these things you call decision management, attention management, and energy management. That's had a profound impact on me because, as I know as an officer in the firm, one of the CEO's biggest um, levels of concern is what are we all choosing, deciding to spend our time on because we have complete autonomy. Right. And we have to be very deliberate now, not just managing our schedule, but managing our decisions. Do I go to Taipei or do I you know, go to Paris? Do I stay home and run this product launch or do I you know, go give a keynote speech? What's the highest return for our clients and for our firm? Uh, yes, and uh, myself too. I, and you know, I, 
uh, think you know this, but I consider myself a laboratory rat. I'm not like, oh, I'm perfect at productivity. This is a work in progress. Every I call single... you a bunny because you're hard on the outside, but you're sweet on the inside. There's no rat about you. <laughs> well, it's just, I mean, that's what you think of it. I'm on my own experiment yeah, with this. Yeah. I'm always thinking about it because um, I'm not perfect. And it's hard work to be um, productive. And to your point, you very intentionally based on these roles, need to be able to think about, should I be saying no to something? And even this morning, you know, I got up early, do some work before coming in and, and meeting with you, and I looked at a few things and I seriously thought to myself, should I be saying no to those things? Because to fulfill who I need to be in my multiple roles at Franklin Covey and prioritizing things, I had, to, I had to have an honest conversation with myself. Should I do that trip? Should I be doing yeah, that sure, thing? Sure. Or based on what I know and the quality of what I need to produce, based on the president and the CEO asking me to get things done, am I doing the right things? Because you can but get how, caught up in doing but everything. Corey, how could you say no to this? I mean, seriously. I would never say exactly, no to you. Exactly. Let's skip choice because we're going to come okay. back to that as our in-depth uh, topic today. Fours, rule your technology. Don't let it rule you. So uh, two things. One, first thing is breaking the um, technology addiction, or yeah. at least coming to terms with it. We're not bad people. We just, our brains are so wired up for, well, the brain has two organizing principles. It avoids threat and it looks for reward. Mm -hmm. um, and it will not do anything else if, you know, if it's not satisfying those two things. So when your cell phone is over there, even if it's turned off, when it buzzes, your mind is going, oh, Unknown. Hmm, I got to figure that out. And at the same time, it's going, or oh, someone well, wants somebody me. needs right. me. Yeah, right. So it's yeah. this terrible combination of threat and reward together that so hooks us into our technology. So the first thing is, particularly knowing the time matrix, how do I start to think about my cell phone? Am I going into a wasteful quadrant by picking it up? Or is this the right time to yeah. be able to do it? So yeah. breaking the addiction is one. And the other piece is taking all of our stuff, our tasks, our, our appointments, our contacts, our notes, identifying where does our stuff go? Where is it? Is it in technology? Is it in What's a planner? System? What's yeah. our system? And then hooking that together with whatever email systems that we're using um, to really create what I call uh, an engine of productivity, yeah, which is right. sort of cool. That scares some people. I've had some people go, wait, what? What do you mean? What do you mean engine of productivity? I was with a client. They're like, wait, wait. And, and I'm like, I oh, want one of those. oh, yeah, I yes. want one of those. Yeah, with, you know, it's the best kept secret. There's some things that we can do yeah. with Outlook that, and once you know these principles, just turn a few things on, understand a few things, and you will welcome emails coming in because you won't be able to live without I will system. definitely have you back on that topic. Okay. Let's close out quickly with five, and then we'll go deep into three. Okay. Five, feel your fire. Don't burn out. Don't just eat three cookies across three meetings, right? Don't just eat three cookies about three meetings. Here's the news. We are knowledge workers today, not industrial age workers for the most part. We're not in factories and mindlessly doing widgets, which takes skill of your uh, hands and your back. We are knowledge workers that are paid to think, to innovate, to create, to execute. And so it's about optimizing mental labor. And so the optimization is the head and the heart, to be honest with you. Again, without going into all of it, there's the, the brain, which is your main engine during the day, requires an enormous amount of oxygen and the right nutrients. And so if you are in a position as a leader uh, or an, an emerging leader where you need to make these high value decisions all day long, right. you need to stay focused when we know it's hard to not be distracted, then you better be eating right, sleeping right, watching your stress levels, um, um, exercise, exercise, moving, moving, moving yeah. right. and is, it's not just exercise, it's moving, right. um, and connecting with other human beings yeah. um, besides just by text. So we call them the five energy drivers mm -hmm. that you really need to assess, because um, you hear it all the time from your parents, oh, you need to do all those things. But understanding the why behind that, you have got to give yourselves what you need for your brain to make those decisions, not only at work, but the minute you show up at home and the door opens and your spouse or partner is standing there waiting like, hi honey, waiting for you to be present, yeah. and you're so completely out of it because you have nothing left. Yeah. So, Have you been sitting behind our front door watching my evenings? <laughs> Let's talk five. about five, or right. talk about three. three. So choice three in the middle is schedule the big rocks, don't sort gravel. You know, this idea was popularized, gosh, 
almost 30 years ago by Dr. Covey in his famed book, First Things First. You and your colleagues co-wrote the next generation of that for this century. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the term big rocks and gravel, give us a bit of a primer on that. So big rocks represents um, the most important things that we need to do. And the gravel is the noise. Um, or in some cases, some people uh, will call it the whirlwind. You know, it's just the day-to-day -day stuff. But gravel is a noise. Big rocks are the most important things you can do. And when you get that metaphor into your head, and then we start to talk about planning, we need to make sure, and, and have this really burned into our heads, that each week or every day, we are, in addition to all the craziness, getting through the one or two, or accomplishing the one or two big rocks that really are important to fulfilling those roles that I mentioned before. You're not disregarding the gravel. No. Because the gravel is part of life. It's part of life. Got to answer emails, got to, uh, you know, people walk into the office and stuff like that. There's ways to minimize a lot of the gravel. That, again, goes back to the conversation in choice one around minimizing the noise from choice one, three, and four. But quadrant two is really where Big Rocks lives. And so no matter what happens, I'm going to get a Big Rock done. And to be honest with you, Scott, sometimes, and I've said this before, in the course of the day, that good Big Rock could be one good, high-quality email that I knew I needed to get out mm. with thought, right? It's not, uh, uh, but it was an email that had yeah. to be well yeah. thought out. It was really important. I'm like, phew. I have one of those today. Done. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's actually it's sort of... Um, Profound that you're saying that because I have a lot I'm doing today, but I have one enormously important email that has to be reviewed by our council and, be, and go to someone. And I could see that being delayed with consequences because my day's already been booked. And that was inserted with a discussion yesterday. So it's interesting you say that. I don't know that I've scheduled that as a big rock on my calendar today. I know it is, but like all things, if it's just up here, it can easily get pushed. It, it'll get pushed, and here's the other thing about that. You, when you go to do it, and not that you don't do fine work, when you go to do it, you're going to be doing it with a little too much urgency attached to yeah. it. Or now that I've procrastinated, I have to change the energy put into it or, and or you, give and, more And because or... you don't, you're not giving yourself breathing space, it's, no matter how good you are, it's not going to be your best work, to be honest with you. Yeah. Because you need some space to let it cook for a minute. Um, and, and, and get rid of some of that urgency. So you got to give yourself a little space. So at least even get, even if it's in the day, getting it in the calendar, I would, I would add 10 minutes to it just to give yourself some breathing space. But of course, a big rock could be a little further out so that you, you know, are not on top of it like that. In, in any insight you would give after, you know, literally speaking on this topic for hundreds of times. Yes. How do people define what's a big rock to them? Is it connected to your roles, relationships? Do they change each day, each week? Uh, maybe for those who don't have the context you or I have, give us some insights on how does someone pick what's a big rock versus gravel? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. And sometimes people will say to me, well, I have to do my laundry. It's, you know, that's not a big rock. Well, you know what? If you don't have any, it might clean, be coming home from a trip with five I, kids, or that, or if you don't have any, there's no clean laundry, there's no clean underwear in the drawer. Uh, you know, it's pretty important. Yeah. So, so you know, it's it's not oh, big rocks is the high and mighty things. Yeah. It's based on your life. Right. And it's a great question because again, in choice to my roles, my roles as a mother, my roles as a vice president, mm -hmm. my role, you know, as a father, whatever it might be, generally drive those big rocks. So. My father is in New York, he's not, it's, and it's, such, it's, it's current. It's not, oh, these are the roles, and they're going to be on the shelf now for the next 40 years of my life. They are today's roles, and, as a, and there's a self-role. There should be a self-role as, as well. My 94-year-old father in New York, I'm very conscious of big, you know, I need to call him. Yeah, right. He never answers because he's like the mayor of the assisted living home, so he's never available, but I will at least call him so he knows I tried. Um, so I'm going to, you know, fit that in. That big rock is connected directly to your role as, as a daughter. Because that's something you defined as one of your values. I, yeah, I got to make sure at this, yeah. you know, sunset of his life that mm -hmm. I am consistent with connecting with him one way um, or another. Um, so, Cole, it, you're a great model of that because you are 
beyond productive and your work is central in your life, not central to your life, but I watch you deliberately schedule weekends in New York with your family in between international trips, right? I mean, you were going to Madrid just two weeks ago to give a major keynote at the World Business Forum, and you live in Scottsdale, or you live in Tucson, Tucson, and you'll make sure that if you're connecting through Atlanta, you could easily connect through New York because you want to get that big rock in and satisfied and you'll make sacrifices in your life to ensure that you connect your big rocks with your roles. I see it all the time. And I'm sure many people who are watching this do that all the time, particularly on this parents aging yeah. you know, journey. And, and just a shout out to my sisters, they are in New York. Mm-hmm. And if you really want models of taking care of my parents as my mother moved on through her journey of Alzheimer's and stuff like that, and now taking care of my father, I live in Tucson, so I'm not there. So yes, and my sisters are my role models. So they're the good Jewish. They're, they're the, the good the, Jewish daughters, right? <laughs> they do a wonderful job, um, and I contribute where I can. So really, I can't even imagine not, you know, yeah, of course, uh, sure. making time yeah. Yeah. to be part of that family. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, in your book, you've popularized, coined this term called the 3010 promise. I think it's crucial to this chapter and choice. Riff on that for a few minutes. So S- S- Stephen actually started with, Stephen Covey started with, um, you know, weekly daily planning. And we, we put the numbers to it to say you should take 30 minutes to do weekly planning and 10 minutes to do daily planning every day. And we turned that into, my co-authors and I turned that into the 30-10 promise. Um, so we say, take 30 minutes before the week starts and quietly think about what are the few big rocks against those roles that you need to put in your calendar, because also writing things down and getting it in neurologically will raise the probabilities of getting that done, and, uh, and, and that's a start. One thing I want to point out here is why 30 minutes? And being from New York City, like 30 minutes is, you know, like a year. Right. For, for New York, it's like, why 30 minutes? I can do it in five. Hmm. The point is, as you've heard some of the emotion by which we're speaking around how we utilize our time, uh, I don't care how much time you take, but you have to get out of your, the back of your brain, uh, your, your reptilian brain. Um, because if we just slow, okay, let me do my weekly you know, planning, you're doing it from an urgency state, a survival state. So we say, take some time, get into the prefrontal cortex, and just take a few minutes, think about my roles, and other things, because it might be, I gotta do the laundry this week, I can't, you know, and think about what are the few big rocks that need to get done and plan them. So if that takes you 20 minutes, fine. For some people, they spend an hour uh, doing it. It's the principle behind the 30-10 promise that we are talking about um, here, that you're doing it intellectually uh, with some heart, not just from a survival point of view. So that's weekly planning to get a few big rocks in your calendar. And then we say 10 minutes at the end of every day. Some people like doing planning in the morning. I have chosen not to uh, because the imminency of the day is upon us. And anybody who's dealing and with young as soon kids. As you wake up, right. Uh, yeah. Right, and people are picking up right. their phones. You go urgent almost immediately. At the end of the day, you know, between, if you can, between work and home is a great time to just, okay, let me just clean up the mess from the day, you know, and... Mark things complete. Do you ever mark things? You like marking things complete? Who doesn't? So the, this the is the satisfaction that comes from that is immeasurable. It is immeasurable, <laughs> and I'll tell you what that is. When you mark, you go. Yes. It's a dopamine hit. It's your, you know, it goes right to the reward center of success. And here's something I see commonly around the world. Let's see if this works for you. Did you ever do this where you know you have a legal pad? And you, know, you started your day and you have your list of things you're going to do. And then you go and you do your stuff. And then you come back to your office and you've done something that wasn't on your list. Yeah. See, I can already tell on your face. Yeah. Right. And when nobody's looking, you write it on the list just to be able to cross it out. Is How that, am I doing? Is that bad? <laughs> it's not bad. It's fun to think about. But um, what you're doing there is you are manufacturing or ensuring yourself that you are accomplishing things. It's like you don't want to miss it. But the problem is when you're doing that and you think about the quadrants, it's a quadrant three or four activity that you're doing because it's sort of useless. But it makes you feel good. The point with that is when you do weekly daily planning, you are much more in control of here's the things that I'm going to get done that are really, really important. 
here's my list of things that will get done. So you will be marking things complete more often yeah. when it's more controlled yeah. and only once in a while will you feel the need to like, oh, I did that, let me cross it up. Corey, you're around the world every month, speaking somewhere, consulting with clients, executive level yeah. and just you know frontline workers sometimes. Yeah. What, what do you find is happening between the nexus of sort of paper and, and technology? Are, 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 are most people still writing their schedule out and printing it off? Are they using it in Outlook? I mean, do you have any insights for all of us who are probably on some sort of digital software that's managing our schedule and appointments? and also are taking task lists, perhaps either on paper or on our phone. Any insight you might give us as everybody's probably going back and forth between some kind of paper. Everyone's still using paper for something, not everyone, but most people. Any insights you might give us on balancing and integrating those two things together? Yes. First of all, so people will say, you know, not, not every single person in the world knows who Franklin Covey is, or they have an idea. Shameful. And, right, and they'll say, oh, oh, Oh yeah, I had a planner yeah, in college, yeah. you know, and I, 40 million people had a planner. Well, yeah. and my my point is, and you'll hear your boss say this also, and I love this, that planner, and we've since sold off that right. company, they right. do quite a few number right. of millions yeah. of dollars right. in business still in paper right. planner business. Um, that tool, the planner, actually was one of the world's most important and well-served leadership development tools in the world. Mm -hmm. It gave people a place where they could be credible, where they can start documenting things. Organized, they had, yeah. And even people, when, when their teams saw them coming with their planner, saw me coming, I was part of that. They're like, okay, this leader has their act together. Mm -hmm. And it, also, it helped model great follow-up um, and accountability. So it was one of the top accountability tools in the world to start us off. So I just want to put that out there and gave us the platform to be able to spin off into the worldwide company we are today around leadership development and performance improvement. Having said that, today, what I'll find is two types of people. I will find people who are almost apologetic that they're using paper, and they'll go, yeah, I, I use a planner. And they're like, and, and you'll find others like, yeah, I still use planner, I love paper, and there it is. There's nothing to be apologetic about. It, whatever, Whatever suits you, as long as you have a system where you know where your tasks are, you know where your appointments are, the mm -hmm. we call this the principle of one. Mm -hmm. I have one place for my tasks, I have one place for my calendar, I have one place for my ancillary notes, and I, know, and I have one place for my files and you know, documents and Repeat stuff like that. Repeat that, I think that is excellent advice. It's okay to have them in different places as long as you only have each in one place. Repeat those four things. Well, again. and digitally, you can, so, so, if you're, that was the beauty of the planner, is you had your tasks in one place, you had your calendar, everything was in one place, you had notes there, right. and then your files, you know, you have your file drawer, et cetera, or, you know, document, you know, your notes. So, the principle of one. You, you can't have three task lists because right. you'll miss, right. or calendar. One in your phone, one in Outlook, and one because on Because you're going to miss something, or you're going right. to miss an appointment. So, right. the principle of one says, the core four, your, your, your stuff, if you had a pile on your desk, it can only be one of four things. It can only be a task, a, a, uh, an appointment, a contact, or a note. Okay. Where's your stuff? Yeah. Is it in Outlook? Is it in, in a planner? Where's your stuff? Because if you have it in Outlook, make sure that your task list syncs. So whenever you go to your task list, you're seeing one task I list. See, yeah. That's what, the same thing with your calendar. Right. And with Exchange and you know, those kinds of things, make sure it syncs. If you're using paper, just don't put it on three pieces of paper. Use one place for it. Right. Um, and if it's a combination, fine. Just more, make sure your paper and your digital is syncing, and then re-download your task list once you've uploaded. It's mm. a little extra work, right. but some people like to do that. Right. So you got to create your own system, and that, a lot of that is done in choice four. Yeah. Great advice. Final minutes. As you're teaching choice three, what do people struggle with the most on, on the principles and the concepts that when they, when they master them, it kind of vaults them into a new level of, of prioritization and, and, and decision management, attention management? I think creating the habit. Um, I have been amazed how many senior leaders and mid-level leaders will go, oh my goodness, the 30-10 the promise, or I like to call it a rule, because I think it should be a rule, um, really has made a difference for me. And you think, these are very intelligent people. You know, and I always, when I talk to these people, I'm always careful, because of course they have planning systems, and you know, it's like, oh, you, we should learn how to do planning. Of course, they didn't get where to, 
they didn't get to where they are not having planning systems. But the rigor of it really seems to affect them. And so, so with that, that inspires me to say that the one thing you have to be careful of is don't just start it and then let it die. Work it, again, with the brain, you gotta practice. You gotta do some things a number of times and eventually it'll become an unconscious yeah. routine. Right. So the biggest thing is stick with it for a while until it just becomes routine or it'll die. And then you go, oh, well that didn't work. I'll try something else. Makes sense. The book, best-selling book, based on a two-day work session or a one-day work session by the same name, you have deputized hundreds of consultants around the world yep. to teach these back in organizations. As a, um, as a leader in our company, you've also made sure that the Five Choices content is in our All Access Pass. Mm -hmm. People have access to all the rich videos, tools, exercises. The book is full of great stories as well. Yes. It's the reason why it became a bestseller. And people can hire you also to keynote speak. You spend too much of your time probably that around was the some, world. That was some of the conversation I was having with myself this morning. Oh, was it? Just yeah. on getting some work done versus some of the, the keynotes and stuff. But it's, it really, there's nothing more important to being out with the real people. So it really, that's, that's the conversation, is uh, the real I learned like so me. much. Yeah. I, I love being here with you, but I love being out with the real people yeah. who are doing the real work out there, because that's where I learn in order to continue to generate yeah. some of the thinking for our yeah. work here at Franklin Well, it's Covey. working. I hope you'll come back. I'd love to talk about choice four, technology, because we're all suffering with that. So yes. if you find yourself back in Salt Lake again, I'd love to have you back on. You're on. Corey, Thank you're you. contagious, and you're smart. And you're Thank relevant. You. Thanks so much. Same here. Tell your dad I said hello. <laughs> Thank you. I will. Take <laughs> right. care. Thanks so much. We've had Corey Kogan today on The Five Choices. Check out franklincovey.com and make sure that you're subscribing to our On Leadership newsletter. comes out every Tuesday via email. Complimentary. And make sure that your friends, your family, your parents are all subscribing. Short videos. You can also access it on your favorite podcast channel. It's all complimentary. We'll see you back next week with a new guest on leadership. Thanks for joining us.